Good morning, everyone. Um, so, as every week for the past two years has had something going on, this week is no different. I got a text yesterday from Jennifer Stevenson, our office manager. She's an equestrian and was working with her horses yesterday, and one of them spooked, or a horse spooked her horse, and she's fine, but she's banged up. You know, when you go up against a horse, you usually don't come out on the winning end. Um, she, she will probably, um, you can't, hello? Oh. So I get to wear my mask all day, every day. So I'm just kind of used to that, sorry. Um, so Jennifer is okay, but she's at home right now. She'll uh, probably work remotely a little bit. Her intent is to come in and work, but I told her, take what time you need, because she is she's banged up a bit, but she's, she's fine. Uh, I'm gonna have Paula McMillan come up in a just, just a second to talk about Pastor John. He too is doing well. Uh, she'll give you more on him. Again, keep watching your emails for announcements. Uh, things change. We, we roll with our punches these days. Uh, if you've had an, uh, an appointment with Pastor John for anything, obviously that's postponed uh, until further notice. Uh, the worship server training that was scheduled for right after the service today, we're not going to be holding that. That'll, be, that'll happen again sometime. Uh, I think that's most everything. We do, well, I do want to point out we have uh, Adam's Christmas piano recital is December 5th. That's uh, Sunday afternoon on December 5th. Be looking forward to that. And we have the blood drive, the Stephen Ehrensberger Memorial blood drive is uh, Tuesday afternoon, November 23rd. That's, we usually ho have that on a Saturday, but we've moved it to a weekday. So Tuesday afternoon, November 23rd. Um, there you go. Again, Pastor John is doing well. Paula, would you come read your, she has a little email from Pastor John. Um, yesterday evening when I was finishing up, Wanda and I were here Saturday setting up for um, the All Saints Day and then I was, or Friday, and then I was here Saturday for a little bit. And um, so as I was leaving, I thought to video the Narthex and the sanctuary of what it looked like and what we had done so that I could send that to him narrated and uh, get some up close pictures so he would have that because I just felt like that might, you know, touch his heart and, and help him uh, feel, you know, part of today uh, because I, I feel his presence here and uh, I wanted Debbie to see it too and I'm very glad that you're, you're able to be with us, um, Debbie. And he did send me a response and he, had, he said that the the videos and the message um, touched him, uh, moved the very core of his heart. And he said, can you imagine how I love the congregation? My fidelity and commitment to faith is unshakable. I have only texted and called a small number of people because my energy is a bit low. But my surgeons and therapists assure me that I'll be back to normal with time and therapy. You know me, I don't worry about myself. I constantly dwell on Debbie. My sisters and I continue to plan for an eventual funeral, definitely after I completely complete rehab. Learning of dad's death from my hospital bed left me with a mysterious and blessed sense of comfort. I spoke with dad Monday, All Saints Day. He had finished his lunch and a cherry pie. Then we briefly spoke. We shared some news. He responded with his still resonant baritone voice. He was weak, but uplifted. Then I made a humorous quip. He responded with laughter, then grew silent. 
My sister Lisa, who was with dad, took the phone and said she'd call back. She later called to say that after dad left, he sat back, took several deep breaths while staring deeply into the horizon, then he slipped away. The last thing my dad and I did together on this earth was to share a laugh. What a beautiful man and death. The moment made clear his faith in the resurrection and it cemented mine. Debbie and I love the congregation. I will be back as strong as ever. Please feel free to share this for all the saints who from their labors rest, pastor. Thank you, Paula. Uh, Pastor John does, he wants me to share his love for, for you all. Uh, he, he's doing fine. He really is. Uh, Debbie will attest to that. And, and we're glad you are, we are glad you're here today. <laughs> it's been a lot for you to ha handle as well. I think that's enough for announcements. Uh, at this point, I want to welcome our guests, Pastor Jonathan Hemphill and Angela, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, it's been a lot. <laughs> uh, and, and I'd like to welcome everyone who's gathering with us online. I believe Pastor John is up there. So say hey to Pastor John. Um, <laughs> and at this point, I think we're ready to begin our service. So sit tight. Let us stand together as we are able. We begin worship this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Have mercy on us, O God. 
We confess. Gives your sins for the sake of Jesus and remembers them no more. Lift up your heads and your hearts. Yours is the kingdom of God. Amen. Let us sing together. Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your people together in one communion in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Grant us grace to follow your blessed saints and lives of faith and commitment, and to know the inexpressible joy you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's welcome Mary as she comes with our children's sermon for the day. All right. Amen, Mary. Come on, guys. Come on. Let me sit down like we have a bed. We'll kind of go over here. All right. Well, I went out to my Dollar General sermon suggestion, and they suggested something that we've already done. And I said, I can't use that because the thief got it. They'll remember it. Remember the one with the bag and he picked out the star and everybody was chosen? I said, they'll remember that. I remember it. So I said, okay, we got to go back and, and punt. So then I checked out some other ones. And one of them suggested that we have three homes. Can you guess what those homes are? got a home that we live in that's, that's not our church home and then we have our heavenly home that's God's home and today is All Saints Sunday and on All Saints Sunday we're, we're celebrating those people that are in our heavenly home and they're people that have influenced our lives and have touched us with their faith. And so today during the service, we're going to ring the bell, the chime back there, and we're going to say the names of the people that we've lost this year. And But I also want us to remember people that maybe we've lost before that. I always think about my mother because she was a saint to me. And she was the one that, that guided me with her faith and helped me build my faith. And I know there's other people. I bet y'all can think of some people that have meant something to you, right? And so let's think about those people. But you know what? We're all saints. So we show God's love. And we use our faith to strengthen other people when they're having a down day. Right? So let's give thanks for all the saints that are here among us. Those that have gone before us. As we look, as we think about today, okay? All right, let's bow our hands. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the saints that you have brought to us to guide us in our faith journey. We thank you for the saints here today and for those we'll meet in the future. In your name we pray and all God's children say, Amen. Amen. The first reading is from Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord.
The second reading is from Revelation. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the, Alma I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to St. John, the 11th chapter. When Mary came from Jesus and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? So Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, the Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus! Come out. The dead man came out. His hands and feet bound with strips and cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. The gospel of the Lord. Praise Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let us pray together. Gracious God, I thank you for this time, this day. Lord, now I decrease that you might increase. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and redeemer, in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say amen. amen. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I bring greetings to you on behalf of Bishop Kevin Strickland and the Southeastern Senate and 160 congregations here in our region. My name is Jonathan Hemphill, and I am joined this morning with my beautiful, amazing, good-looking <laughs> wife, uh, Angela Hemphill. We are so grateful to be here in person, but also those watching us online we greet you as well and we're glad that you're be, you're here as well and pastor john if you're listening we're praying for you we're believing god for a speedy recovery you take the time that you need and know that god will work all things out and you have good stock here at faith lutheran because i can see y'all work ethic y'all make it happen say amen church amen. 
Well, listen, I, I've been here, I'm, I'm new to this area, y'all. I've been here for about 60 days now, all the way from Los Angeles, California. Hey, I know, right? <laughs> so my wife and I, we live in College Park, Georgia, and uh, we are serving, uh, we're serving here in this region as assistant to the bishop for Congregational Life. So we're excited to be here and like, excited to share with y'all. And we're new to this cold. We, it's cold out there. So we got to get, we got to get winter coats. We don't even know about that. I, I put on like a little, uh, little track jacket yesterday. I was just, babe, you got to go try again. So anyway, listen, I want to talk this morning from the theme, when Jesus cries. When Jesus cries. We find ourselves on the Sunday in which we, and the church tradition is to celebrate all saints. Traditionally, we celebrate all saints on November 1st, the day after all Hallow Eve, Halloween, if you will. The connection for us is to celebrate those who have gone on before us, those who have died in the Lord. The Christian festival of all saint days come from the conviction that there is a spiritual connection between those in heaven and those here on earth. A quick connection that we make in our communion liturgy and in our congregation is at the altar, where oftentimes we have an altar that is facing the wall. And most times the altar is facing the wall because on the other side of the altar in a lot of congregations and churches, you will find a cemetery. That connects those saints both present and those both living here as a communal part of the body of Christ. Our Catholic counterparts associated saints which were certain individuals who have deemed sainthood as ones to commemorate. While our Lutheran faith expands this to include all those who have died, regardless of position, leadership, cultural significance, life aspiration, class, gender, and any other specific category that we differentiate. We celebrate all saints, regardless of life, and we reflect on their memory. Today is not a sad day. It is not a melancholy day or a dull day in our church here. It is a day to celebrate life and all the life has to offer. We recognize the ups and the downs that God gives. But we also recognize that God does give. And the same God that gives is the same God that takes away. God is sovereign and it's God's will to decide life. After all, we confess that God is the giver of life. And our response to life is lived in thankfulness to what God is doing and what God has done. Even in the face of death, even in the face of the death of our loved ones, the ones we hold dear and near, we must give thanks. I'm always gripped with the, my own reality of mortality. For I have suffered and wrestled with my own close relatives who have gone on. For three years in a row now, I have experienced loss. My mom, my two sisters. And I can remember the feeling of pain and turmoil, turmoil of these untimely deaths. And I remember praying and asking God, why? And struggling with picking up the pieces of my family. Even now, as I have moved away, I am still reeling and picking up the pieces of those that I've lost in trying to hold and keep my family intact. Quite often in my role as a pastor, I'm on the flip side of death. I help families to process this. I share last rites with those who are dying and are, are close to dying. I serve families during funerals and commit moraines to the earthly resting place. Oh, but to be on the flip side is such a different perception. I had to work through my own grief through counseling and, and, and coaching because three people died in a relative short period of time. And when that happens or when anybody dies that's close to us, boy, it can certainly mess us up. Am I right about it? Say amen, church. I mean, it can rock your faith. And certainly here today, uh, I share and give thanks for my mom and whose faith in God has allowed me to grow to become the man that I am. And I give thanks for my two sisters, Chastity and Rosalind, who I got to love and be loved by. I give thanks for my dad, who taught me how to dance and have swag and enjoy life. And even in moments of sadness and missing them, 
I know that they are gathered with the saints. And for this, I give God thanks. Many like me here have experienced trial and travail. Some have experienced the tension that hangs in the balance between life and death. And all of us over the last year and eight months have been witness to a death toll like never before. We have seen the countless numbers of lives taken by a virus that demands absolute will over life. We've seen violence reel through our communities and devastate families. We have been spectators of natural disasters by way of hurricanes and earthquakes and fires and floods in our country and our region. We've all had our fair share of dealing with life that hangs in the balance. We too have wept. We've cried. We have lamented. We have been grief stricken. We too have carried the burdens of others, the pain of loss and the struggle to make sense of it all. When we come to this text, where for me, it would be all too easy for us to get excited about the end of the text. It would be all too easy to preach the celebratory parts of the text. But in my mind, it would almost be wrong and really not sensitive to the writer or the hearer Seemingly just to perfunctory gloss over the hard parts, the uncomfortable parts, the not feel good parts, and to celebrate Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead seems to just not be, I think, where God is calling for us in the text. How many times can we hear this sermon preached? How many times do we get excited about Lazarus getting up? How many hallelujahs and shouts of jubilations can we exclaim for the raising of Lazarus? And please don't misinterpret my feelings here. I, too, am excited about Lazarus getting up. But I think if we go too fast, we miss perhaps some great profound nuggets that Jesus has for us this morning. Yeah, we, we can make some assertions around the anger of Mary about the fact that Jesus arrived, if, that if Jesus would have arrived earlier, her brother would have not died. But I'd like to explore that just for a moment. Because so many times, especially over the last year or so, the question of faith has been in the forefront of people's thought process. In my previous call, I serve young adults. And in my congregation there serving young adults, often the question around uh, amid death and dying certainly was, where is God? Where is God in the midst of all of this? If God is faithful, why would he allow COVID-19? If God is faithful, why would he allow good things to happen, bad, I mean, bad things to happen to good people? Why did God take my grandma, my husband? Why does God allow cancer? And all these questions uh, get right at the heartstrings of life when perhaps all these questions are, are valid, but even a bigger faith formation construct concerning death is God did not even present, prevent his own son from dying on the cross. And Jesus even prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, Lord, if it's thy will, let this cup pass. But if not, Yours be the glory. Hmm. Could that be the answer to, 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 to the questions of life and death? Yours be the glory. Could that answer suffice from our lips to our hearts? Yours be the glory. Your will be done on earth, Lord, as it is in heaven. Could it not be that God gets the glory over our own desires for life? I'm excited that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. I am filled with joy about this miracle that happened and the joy of Mary and Martha must have felt to be able to witness this, to, to be able to silence the haters and the naysayers, to shut down those that are around them who would dare ask a question, could Jesus do this? Goodness. The same one who healed the blind, the same one who healed the man of leprosy, took care of the paralytic, could he not perform this simple task? And they came to Jesus when Jesus was vulnerable. But I think they missed perhaps that he, and I think sometimes we even miss that sometimes in our own desolation, desol, uh, desolation in our own grief, and in our own break, brokenness, 
there is still humanity in that. And they miss Jesus' humanity here. They miss Jesus' heart here. They miss Jesus' brokenness. And I'm not to say that Jesus was broken because we recognize that he was sinless. But I want to say that Jesus was human. And he feels what we feel. He goes through the things that we've gone through. He experiences the ups and the downs of life just as we experience the ups and the downs. He had struggles, and yes, he even had to suffer. And if we are alive today, and we're here today, all of us can say with a certainty, I've had some mountaintop experiences, amen. But I've also experienced some valleys experiences today. And if we're not careful with scripture, we'll miss the nuances and only ascribe Jesus' humanity to the cross. Where in my mind there is a clear indicator here of Jesus' heart. Jesus wept. And it is the shortest scripture in Bible in the Bible, and folks get excited of his shortness. Man, what's the best, the quickest scripture in the Bible? Jesus wept. But, but perhaps it is the most profound scripture in the Bible as well. Because what it does is it brings Jesus from the ethereal into the tangible. It brings him from the eternal to the immortal. It brings him from the heavens to the earth. It makes Jesus real and approachable, just like you and I. And here Jesus is, his buddy, his ace, his close friend, his confidant. He's died. And for a moment in scripture, we are invited into the grief, the loss, the sorrow. We're invited into the place where Jesus wept. I don't want us to miss that moment. Because I believe that that's not only, a, I, I believe that that's not the only moment that Jesus cries. Perhaps it is the only moment that is mentioned in scripture. But I believe that Jesus Christ is more than just that. We can get excited now. Because we recognize that when Jesus cries, things happen. When Jesus cries, things go into effect. When Jesus cries, lives are awakened. When Jesus cries, things get done and the dead comes to life. When Jesus cries, blinded eyes are open. The lame walks just as it's served. Everything that's broken is made whole. Life is abandoned. Life becomes worth living. Ooh. When Jesus cries, my goodness, he shuts the mouth of the haters. The captives are set free. Freedom happens. The bound is loose. The marginalized makes a difference. The seas rejoice and the lilies of the field dance in splendor. When Jesus cries, vaccines are made possible. Life that hangs in the balance is revived. Hope is revered. Joy is revealed. And people are made whole. My goodness. When Jesus cries, and I invite Adam to come as I close, it does not mean that life becomes normal. But it means that I learn to live in the new normal with new excitement for things to come. It does not mean that everything is going to be okay. It means that I learn to be okay with living the new realities of life. It means that I develop skills and ability to cope with change. Knowing that God is a present help always in our time of trouble. When Jesus cries, the earth shakes. The foundations are uprooted. And sometimes Lazarus is lifted in the midst of chaos. Sometimes in the midst of dead seasons, that's when life is made anew. And it is always out of the ashes that Phoenix rises to new life. From the resurrection of Jesus Christ amid a stinky tomb, a stinky situation, a bad season, a bad call, a faulty system, a broken reality, a failed business plan, a failed marriage, fractured relationships, life seemingly hangs in the balance. Will this bring mama back? Will it bring my husband back? No. Will it bring my wife back? No. Will it heal our disease? No. 
Will it put a stop to COVID-19? No. But what it will do is help us to know that Jesus cries with us. And amidst his tears, there is fullness of life. Beloved, I came this morning to say that no matter what you go through, no matter what the season and experiences are in your life, no matter how deep your sorrow is, those that sorrow in tears will reap in joy. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. And my earnest prayer for you here at Faith and those watching us online is that you can find that joy. Joy in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us continue worship in the words of our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God. going to continue with our word, our prayer of intercession. Tim, I'm going to ask you to ring an extra bell for those 
who have died that are not listed in our worship folder this morning when we get to, to the end of that time. Let us pray. Eternal God, you hold firm amid the changes of this world. Hear us now as we pray for the church, the world, and everyone in it. Creator God, we praise you for your abundant harvest and the goodness of creation. Create communities of care for your earth so that all land, water, and soil may be celebrated and cherished by future generations of saints. Hear us, O oh God. God of healing, we give you thanks. For health care workers who labor around the clock to answer the cries for help, bring wholeness to all who struggle with post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression, addiction, and for all who long for healing in, the, in any way, hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of justice, we praise you for your, the feeding ministries and for meals, for all meals that bring people together for nourishment and fellowship. Bless chefs, bakers, servers, dishwashers, and meal ministry coordinators. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. We pause this morning to lift up those things that are in our hearts, both silently and aloud. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God of the ages, we give thanks for the saints who have inspired, challenged, loved, and taught us. We remember especially those uh, from our midst who have died during the past year, but also those of our family members that are not listed here as well. Frederick Louise Bauer. Geneva Sue Bauer. Joanne Bohannon. Thelma Grantham. Gary Grimes. Marie Hatcher. Charles Edward Holman, Jr. Billy Sue Holsey. Lynn Nose. Bobby Lee. Earl Ray Thompson. Jean McRae. Eloise Matthews, Roger Miller, Doris Renate Moore, Dale Nelson, Larry James Quinn, Tammy Ritchie, Ruth Spitzer, James Council Steyerwalt, Eloise Wall, all the victims of COVID-19, those not listed as well. By the way, our tears and lead us by their example into the feast together on your holy mountain. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God, our protection is strength. We entrust to you all for whom we pray. Remain with us always through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. Let us share in our community right around our little chair area the peace of the Lord with those around us. Amen.
continue in worship with our offering. Holy God, the earth is yours and everything in it, yet you have chosen to dwell among your creatures. Come among us with these gifts of bread and wine and strengthen us to be your body for the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through Jesus, our through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who on the day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the choirs of angels and the church on earth, the hosts of the heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. God, our maker, redeemer, and healer, and the harmonious world of your creation, the plants and animals, the seas and stars, were whole and well in your praise. When sin had scarred the world, you sent your son to heal our ills and to form us again into one. The night in which our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it. Gave thanks and gave to all his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup of the new covenant and said, This is my blood shed for you and for all, for the forgiveness and the remission of sins. Take and drink. Do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, remember in the acts of, in healings, his body has been given up and his, he has victory over death. We await the day when all peoples of the earth will come to the river to enjoy the tree of life. Send your spirit upon us in this meal as grain scattered up on the hillside become one bread let your church be gathered from all the ends of the earth, that all may be fed with this bread of life, your son. And through him, all glory and honor is yours. Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Church, both now and forever. Amen. Let us pray the prayer of the faithful. Our Father. Feast of love is offered here for you and for all the saints. Let us sing together. You may be seated.
all received the communion kit when you came in this morning. At this time, I ask you to please take the bread from that kit because this is the body of Christ that was given for you. Let's partake together. Now let's take that little cup. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let's partake together. Please stand as you're able. Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you forever in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed Jesus, at this table that you set before us, you have been with both host and meal. Now send us forth and extend our tables as we share your gifts until the day when all feast together at your heavenly banquet. Amen. the blessing. God, the beginning and the end, who has written your name in the book of life, bless you and keep you in grace and peace from this time forth and forevermore. And let the church say, Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. Rejoice in all God's saints. on by the saints before us. Let us go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. God bless you today.